Oh. Um, election season is coming. It's like winter is coming. Election season is coming. It's almost here. In another couple weeks, we won't have to put up with all the terrible ads that I'm sure you're seeing on TV and wherever. Um, and I am looking forward to that. But, you know, as one, we, we tend to look to our politicians to be the people to make the change in our country, to make this country more civilized, a, a better place to live. But you know what? Sometimes they do a great job. Sometimes they, we don't think they do a great job. But I don't think it should be just left to the politicians to make this place a beautiful, civilized place of love. You know, we are a country founded on Christian principles. We are a country founded on by people who believed in the Lord and believed in being good, kind people. Um, and so I was thinking about, there's this story I want to tell you about. Sometimes I think, like, how can I make a difference? I don't want to be a politician. You couldn't pay me. Millions of dollars would not be enough to pay me to be a politician. I, you couldn't pay me enough to do it. But that doesn't mean that I, one little person, can't make a difference in this country. And I think a lot of ourselves ask, ask, ask ourselves that. Like, I'm just one person. What difference can I make? I'm just one person. Aside from my vote every four years, or two years, you know, Senate and Congress and all that, how can I make a difference? And I want to tell you the story. It's, it's a strangely timed story because we would typically think of the story in March. Um, I want to tell you the story today of St. Patrick. You know, the guy that everyone thinks is a leprechaun and, like, chased all the snakes out of Ireland. Both are not true. <laughs> there were no snakes in Ireland before he got there. He did not chase the snakes out of Ireland, which I just, I didn't even know that was a thing that people think that. And he didn't wear green all the time. He wore normal clothes. <laughs> so, um, St. Patrick was born Maywin Sakut. Like, that's his real name was Maywin. Um... And so he was, he growing up, he was actually an atheist or a pagan. He was a person who didn't really believe that God was a thing. His family were Christians, uh, his parents were, but he didn't. He didn't have those beliefs. He was just a 16-year-old kid who, you know how it is at 16, you think the world is your oyster and do whatever you want, and I don't care about all that stuff. And uh, so one day, he was working out in the, out in the fields, they, they were farmers, and uh these marauders came from Ireland, these barbarians. So barbarians are very uncivilized, rough and tough people. They invaded England, where uh, Maywin lived, and they kidnapped him, and they took him back to Ireland and made him a slave. And for six years, he was a shepherd. So the 16-year-old kid was shoved out in the fields to take care of the sheep, and, and if you do it, we'll, we'll let you eat and live. <laughs> And so he had this really hard, really lonely life for six years out being a, a slave um, out in the fields as a shepherd. And, and eventually he's like, okay, I'm going to try this God thing that all my, my parents talked about because I feel really hopeless. He felt so hopeless, hopeless and alone that he turned to God. And, and all for six years while he was there, he started talking to God every day. And during that course of time, he eventually gave his life to Christ. Which I just think is amazing that without anybody leading him to Christ. He came to Christ on his own because he just talked to God every day. I mean, think about what it would be like to be a shepherd. You're just hanging out all day by yourself with the sheep. So he must have talked to God a lot. So he gave his life to Christ, and about six years into his slavery, he had a dream, and in the dream, God said, all right, I want you to go east, hop on a boat, and go home. And he's like, we. Okay. That sounds great. And so he did. He just left the field and walked to the seaport and found a boat and got on it and he went home. And when he got home, because he'd given his life to Christ, he went to a monastery and he lived in a monastery um, and studied there for 12 years. And then I think he was home for 20. He, God said, I want you to go back to Ireland and witness to those people there. So these are like Pagans, barbarians, they don't believe in God. They're rough people. They're the people who stole him from his home. Um, it was They were not nice people, these barbarians that lived there. And I'm sure he's like, you want me to do what? <laughs> like, but God, you brought me home. God's like, yeah, now I want you to go back. And so he went to the Catholic Church, uh, and he said, hey, can you guys help me? Can you send some people with me so that I don't have to do this by themselves? By myself and they're like no way those people are unreachable they are too barbaric they're too much of heathens 
you're not going to be successful. We are not going to risk the lives of anyone else to help you on this mission. We wish you well, but we're not sending anybody with you. So he went basically by himself back to Ireland. The first thing he did was he went back to his former master and brought him money to pay him what he had lost by, by him leaving him. Uh, and the rumor has it that his former boss put his, saw him coming and was like, oh my gosh, he's coming to kill me. And so he set his house on fire and sat inside it to die so that Patrick couldn't do anything bad to him. And Patrick's like, no, no, stop it. Come out here. Like, and he ended up converting him. He was supposedly his first convert. And so what, what Patrick did is he had a system. He was very systematic. He would go to a city. He would set up camp outside the town. And he would first go to the leaders. And he would share the gospel with them. And if they converted, awesome. Then they were on his side. He would get them to give basically their blessing that he could live outside their city. And so he would live outside their city, living the Christian life. He would, and he'd make a little colony of Christians outside the city. And they would serve and love on the people within the city. And eventually, over time, people would be like, you're weird. And we like it. Like, you're not the heathen barbarian that the rest of us are. You're, like, nice. And you help people, and you're selfless. Why are you like that? Why do you do that? And so that gave him the opportunity to share the gospel with them. And over time, people were like, yeah, I like this idea. This sounds great. And so people would start to give their lives to Christ, and they would come into the little colony, and the little colony outside the town would start to grow. And even people within the town would start to give their lives to Christ, and eventually the whole town would kind of give their lives to Christ, and they would become Christians. <clears throat> And then once that kind of got up and running, Patrick would train up a couple of the people there to be leaders and keep it going. And then he would take a couple of people with them and they'd go do the same thing in another city. And, and it's recorded, they, have, they, they can totally give credit, thousands of people that Patrick uh, baptized. Thousands. That's amazing to me. This country that was 0% Christian has, is now 75% Christian. 70% of them are Catholic. And that's down. Ireland, like America, has people like leaving Christianity. Um, and, but, but for a long time, I couldn't find actual statistics. For a long time, Ireland was predominantly Christian. And all of that is because one man was brave enough to go back and be the weirdo that lived outside the city and lived a different life. And eventually the whole city became, or the whole country, basically became Christian. And that's just amazing to me that one man had that power. One man who loved Jesus enough to go do this hard thing and just love on people. He did all that with the help of the Holy Spirit, obviously. And so I think about that and I think about the United States. I feel like we're kind of the opposite. We were founded on Christianity. Most of the early pilgrims were Christians. They founded this nation on Christ, Christian principles. Our laws, if you look at our laws, a lot of the, especially the early laws, they line up with biblical principles. And yet now, you know, it used to be when, when I was a kid, and gosh, for sure, when you guys were kids, most people in America were Christians. Most, these, this place was full. That balcony was full. That balcony was full. Because so many people were Christians. And not just check the box on your census form, Christians, but practicing Christians. Nowadays, 14% of Americans come to a church building during the week. 14%. 65 or 70% check the box. And I'm not saying you have to come into a building to be Christian. You don't. There are house churches where people love the Lord. There are people who love the Lord but don't go to church. Okay, I'm not saying you have to come into a church. It's just a good way to measure where we're at. And so our country is heading towards more, more barbaric ways. If you look at some of the things that are happening in this country, I feel like we're going backwards, becoming de-civilized in some ways. And we need, we need the pendulum to shift back. And how do we do that? We do it by being like St. Patrick. We do it <clears throat> by being, a, the, those of us that are small, we do it by being a colony of... A colony of heaven. The, I love the Passion Translation, and the Passion Translation is the only one that I know that uses this verbiage, and I love it. He says, "My, um, this is Paul. So, St. Patrick, 
obviously read the Bible because he was a monk in a monastery, and he took his he took his playbook, if you will, from the disciples who took their playbook from Jesus. Okay, so Paul, he's a guy in the Bible who was a church planner, and he did a, he basically did what Patrick did. He would go to a place with a, one mother person, and they would create a little colony of heaven right there, and eventually people would be like, why are you different? And they would join it, and eventually then that whole city would get converted to Christianity. And if you look in Europe, they're like us. They were mostly Christian, and now they're kind of on the downward spiral uh, also. But that's the way Jesus did it. Patrick followed Jesus' playbook. Patrick's, or Patrick followed the disciples' playbooks, which you read in the Bible. And so Paul was a church planter uh, right after Christ. And this is what he wrote to his church. He had planted back in Philippi, which is Macedonia area. He said, my beloved friends, imitate my walk with God. Follow all of those who are walk according to the ways of life we have modeled before you. For there are many who live by different standards. As I've warned you many times, and I weep as I write these words, they are enemies of the cross of the anointed one, and doom awaits them. Their God has possessed them and made them mute. Their boast is in their shameful lifestyle, and their minds are in the dirt. If you watch movies and listen to music and look at some of the news, I think many of us could agree that there are many people in this country whose minds are in the dirt. There are many people in this country who boast in their shameful lifestyles, who are making it cool to be barbarians, who are not as civilized as we would consider to be civilized, who are all about themselves and getting rich and getting popular and all that. Instead of giving to others and healing others and helping others, they've swung the other way. And, and Paul is saying, look, to the church of Philippi, they also were surrounded by pagans, people who were barbarians. And he's like, hey, keep on the right path. And here's my part, my, oh, where'd it go? Oh, no. There it is. Oh. Oh, no, my favorite part's missing. Anyways, he says, for we are a colony of heaven on earth. Our job is to be a colony of heaven on earth. Our job is to live the Christ-like lifestyle in such a way that people are like, why are you weird and different but in a good way? Why are you helping people? Why are you giving your money away to people? That doesn't make sense. Why are you nice? That person was a jerk to you. Why are you nice to them? You should, they were a jerk to you. You should be a jerk to them. Why are you kind? Why, why do you have hope? Don't you see how hopeless this situation is? How can you possibly have hope? And that's when we, as citizens of heaven, because when you give your life to Christ, you become a citizen of heaven. You have dual citizenship. You're an American, and also you're a citizen of heaven. You're God's citizen. And so when we colonize where we are, and we start to look different, people will ask you, like, why are you like that? Did I get filled? Uh, all right, well, and the other, it's in your bulletin. <laughs> First Peter, um, where's your bulletin? Oh, I put my glasses. All right, in your bulletin. First Peter, make sure that your hearts, um, in your hearts, you honor Christ as Lord. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope you have. Be ready to give the reason for it, but do it gently and with respect. He's like, look, when you live a different lifestyle, when you live the civilized <clears throat> lifestyle, the barbarians are going to realize it. And they're going to be like, why are you like that? And that gives you an opportunity to say, because, because I love Jesus and he loves me. Because I have hope. When you have hope in a hopeless situation, and people are like, how can you be chipper about this? How can you, why aren't you falling apart? You can be like, because. Because I believe that God is good. And I believe that even though this looks hopeless, God's going to come through in some way. God's going to redeem this in some fashion. Because I trust the Lord. And that, then they're going to be like, well, I, I don't want to be stressed out. I want, I want what you got. And that's how we share the gospel. That's how Patrick did it. Patrick didn't stand on street corners with a sign that says repent or die. He didn't hand out tracts. 
You know, he, he just loved people. And then when they came to him, he told them the truth. He told them about Jesus. And that, that kernel of hope spread to them like a virus, you know, it spread out. And so our job as Christians, when you give your life to Christ, your job is to be a citizen of heaven and to colonize where you are. Colonize your family. Colonize your neighborhood. Colonize where you work. Colonize your city. When we serve God with love, people will notice and they are going to talk to you about it. Or they'll be like, oh, I know Paula. She works at that church all the time. She's different. I bet it's because she is a Christian. So whether they ask you or not, if they know that you're Christian and they see that you are loving, they're going to start to equate those two. And eventually, hopefully, they'll come to you and say, all right, tell me, tell me how you do this. And that's your opportunity to share the love of the Lord with them. We don't do it by going knocking on door to door. We do it by living a life that is noticeably different in a good way. And then the barbarians want to come to our way of thinking. And so if you want to make this country awesome, be the change you want to see in the world. Gandhi wasn't a Christian, but I love that phrase. Be the change you want to see. <clears throat> Don't just vote and hope that those people in Washington and Frankfurt do it for you. We each have the power to colonize and to spread the gospel where we are. If one person can turn an entire country into Christians, certainly you can help in your family, in your neighborhood, in your city to turn the tide and bring people back to Christ. And so your dare, I dare you, this week to get closer to God, to do something tangibly to bring you closer to God and to help you share the love of God with others. So do a self-assessment. Really sit down. If you're a journaler, I'm a journaler. Um, or while you're driving, don't journal and drive. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like talk whatever where your quiet time and you talk to God. Do a self-assessment. Are you living a life that is noticeably beautiful, that is noticeably selfless, that is so set apart that others would ask you where your hope comes from? Do you stand out against the barbarians of your life? Or are you just like them? Do you talk the talk when you're with them in such a way that they don't even notice that you're different? Ask God to show you ways that you can colonize your family, your neighborhood, your workplace. And ask God to help you find at least one other person to colonize with. Because when Paul went out, he had a buddy. Like the disciples went out two by two. They didn't go out by themselves. So if you don't have a buddy, ask God to bring you a buddy so that you have someone to do that with. Uh, I recommend you read Philippians 3. Uh, Philippians is a short book. It only has, like, I think, five chapters altogether, maybe six. Uh, but Philippians 3 is a really good one. It, it's kind of a here's what you should be doing, and then this is why. So I, I like Philippians 3. And then to engage. Engage is always how can we get out there? Like how can we serve other people? The first three are kind of about your own personal growth. This is about how you can reach others. So come up with some ways that you can live your life out loud in your sphere. What habit or two might stand out enough so that people ask you where your hope comes from? You know, what could you do on a regular basis that people like, why do you do that? See if you can't come up with something that makes you stand out. So if you have not surrendered your heart to the Lord, if you are not yet a citizen of heaven, I would love to walk you through that. It's super easy. You basically just say, I want to be part of it. And Jesus says, come on in. So if you have not done that yet, you can come down during this song. Um, and we are going to stand as you're able and sing Heal Our Land, number 800.